Hey guys, how's it going? I want to go over the study on my website that I've had for a while. I tried to finish up today. I kind of rushed it. It could be touched up a little bit. But anyways, we're going to talk about Kevin Zacker teaching the Abraham's Bosom Doctrine, which is a false doctrine, and I've talked about it before. I'm going to make more videos on it. It's a quite popular false doctrine. And the interesting thing about Kevin Zacker's teachings on it is that he brings new verses to the forefront that I've never seen used for before and the ways that he's using them. And I don't know if he came up with this stuff by himself or if he learned it from somebody else. But basically, uh, let's just get started here. We got no man hath ascended. He talks about John chapter 3 verse 13, which says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And he says, when Jesus spoke this, it was still the Old Testament. Jesus had not died yet. He had not shed his blood on the cross. And so people went to paradise and uh, what he means is that when it says no man hath ascended to heaven, he's saying because Jesus hadn't died yet, the souls of the dead saints went to a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise that was with hell or next to hell or was in hell. And uh, they couldn't yet go to heaven until Jesus died on the cross. Now that's absolutely false. So let's, uh, I got some commentaries here to try to help explain this verse. And no man hath ascended up. There can be no means of receiving heavenly truth. No man hath learnt it and is able to teach it except the Son of Man who ever was and is in heaven. The thought has met us before in John chapter 1 verse 18, which says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. So basically in John chapter 3 verse 13 we got Jesus saying that no man hath ascended up to heaven except for himself. And then in John chapter 1 verse 18 it says that no man hath seen God except for Jesus himself. So we have to try to understand the context here, what's being said here. To Nicodemus it must have come as an answer to the words of Agur which had passed into a proverb to express the vanity of human effort to know God, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. No man had so passed to heaven and returned again to earth, but there was one then speaking with him, who had been in heaven with God, and could tell him its eternal truths. He had that knowledge which a man could obtain only by ascending to heaven, and he came down from heaven with it. From the human point of view, he was as one who had already ascended and descended. This is, ev this is the evident meaning of the sentence, and the form is quite consistent with it. To explain the perfect tense of the future ascension, or to introduce the idea of the hypostatic union by virtue of which the human nature may be said, to have ascended into heaven with the divine is to give an explanation, not of the text, but a misunderstanding of it. So basically, to sum up this verse, I wrote, No man currently walking the earth has been to heaven and can so speak of heavenly truths as Jesus did, for he has been in heaven with the Father eternally as God the Son. So I hope that you get this. Try to understand the context here. It says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven. Now is that trying to say what Kevin Zacher is trying to say? That the souls of the saints didn't go to heaven yet because Jesus hadn't died yet? Or is it saying that Jesus is saying, in the verse before this, Jesus says, If you don't believe me, if I speak of earthly truths, now, how will you believe when I speak of heavenly truths? And then he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, except for he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, speaking of himself. So he's saying, I can speak of these heavenly truths because I have been there. You know, it's speaking of the deity of Christ, that he was eternally with the Father as God the Son. So is that the true inter interpretation of the verse? Or Kevin Zachers, what's the point here? Okay, what's the point of this verse? Is it to say that the souls of the saints didn't go to heaven? No, absolutely not. Of course they did go to heaven. And of course they, we still go to heaven, the saints. So, get that. 
all right? And this is one of the main verses that these people who teach Abraham's bosom will use and teach out of context. It's totally missing the point of that verse. Of course, there's lots of other verses that he totally misses the point on. Led captivity captive. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10, it says, Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Speaking of Jesus, of course. Kevin Zacher says something kind of weird in this clip, talking about how Jesus led captivity captive. And he says that the saints who are in heaven are, in a sense, captive. And uh, that's just kind of bizarre. You know, there's verses that speak about the saints being slaves to righteousness. Okay, slaves to righteousness. But um, I don't think there's really a sense in which the saints are captives in heaven. But anyways, uh, basically what people use... What they teach in this verse, they say that Jesus led captivity captive, and they try to say that these saints that couldn't yet go to heaven, they were in this special place called Abraham's bosom or paradise, which was in hell or next to hell. They were basically captive there, and so Jesus, after he died on the cross, he went there and he led them up to heaven. And they'll try to use maybe... Um, when it says, now that he ascended, what is it but that he is also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Because they use other verses out of context, and they try to teach that this place called Abraham's bosom or paradise uh, was in the earth. And so they'll say, the lower parts of the earth, they'll say, see, Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth, so therefore, you know, there was this other place besides heaven where the saints went. So let's try to understand what this verse really teaches, because it doesn't teach any of that. He led captivity captive, which is expressive of Christ's con conquests and triumphs over sin, Satan, the world, death, and the grave, and indeed every spiritual enemy of his and his people, especially the devil, who leads men captive at his will and is therefore called captivity, and his principalities and powers whom Christ has spoiled and triumphed over, the allusion is to the public triumphs of the Romans in which captives were led in chains and exposed to open view. So this should be kind of self-explanatory. Captivity is seen as a bad thing here. Um, you know, sin puts people into bondage. They're in bondage in the sin. And, and death is, you know, in a sense being captive and Jesus took all these things, and he triumphed over them. So in a sense, he took them captive. Okay, um, That's what that means. Um, now, let's talk about the lower parts of the earth. To the lowest state of humiliation. This seems to be the fair meaning of the words. Heaven stands opposed to earth. One is above, the other is beneath. From the one Christ descended to the other, and he came not only to the earth, but he stooped to the most humble condition of humanity here. See Philemon chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, compare notes in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 23. Some have understood this of the grave, others of the region of departed spirits, but these interpretations do not seem to be necessary. It is the earth itself that stands in contrast with the heavens. And the idea is that the Redeemer descended from his lofty eminence in heaven and became a man of humble rank and condition. Here is Psalm chapter 139, verse 15. And this basically says the same thing, but I wanted to use this uh, commentary too. It says, These words mean nothing more than the condition of the present life, to torture them so as to make them mean purgatory or hell, which is basically what this Abraham's bosom doctrine is. It's a form of purgatory is exceedingly foolish. The argument taken from the comparative degree, the lower parts, is quite unattainable. The comparison is drawn not between one part of the earth and another, but between the whole earth and heaven, as if he had said, 
that from that lofty habitation Christ descended into our deep gulf. Okay? And so there's also the idea here that, that Christ humbled himself so, okay, to become a servant. And so Christ, the Son of God, who is deity, who is God, took on human flesh. So that's the idea that he descended, that he took on flesh, he came to our earth, and uh, of course he ascended, okay, he's resurrected. So that's it. He took captivity captive because on the cross, uh, you know, he conquered Satan and, uh, and sin and death and the power of all those things. So, I think that Kevin Zacker here goes on to try to, to try to defend his view that the saints in heaven are captives, and which is kind of like a side thing to this doctrine. It's not really... Uh, he's just going off here even worse, but let's go over it anyways. He says, uh, let's just play this clip. Let's see. So what, where does this idea of four in so Ephesians chapter 4 verses 8 through 10 come from? Uh, turn, from back from? Uh, turn back to Psalm 69. Turn back to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. And uh, look at verse 33. And, uh, look at verse 33. Psalm 69. Psalm 69. And verse and 33. Verse 33. For the Lord heareth the poor. For the and Lord despiseth not the poor, his prisoners. And despiseth oh, not we love his it. prisoners. To be the prisoner of the Lord oh, Jesus Christ. You know, that's what Paul to be said. The prisoner of the he Lord said he was Jesus a prisoner Christ. of the Lord you know, Jesus Christ. Said. He that's said he was a prisoner of the Lord prisoner. Jesus Christ. Be taken captive by the Lord Jesus prisoner. Christ. Be taken captive because by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you are his possession. You've been because redeemed by his, his blood. You've been you are not redeemed, redeemed by his because blood. Jesus spent you three days and nights tortured in the Jesus depths of hell, three days and nights agonizing and being out in pain from the flames down there, being out in pain from the flames down there. Satan's discretion. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That is pure wickedness. Jesus Christ is pictured holding the keys of death and hell. Jesus Christ is pictured holding the keys of death and hell. Okay, so he reads from Psalm chapter 69, verse 33. It says, For the Lord heareth the poor and despises not, despises not his prisoners. And so his commentary says, And despises not his prisoners. He does not overlook them. He does not treat them as if they were worthy of no attention or regard. The word prisoners here may refer to those who are, as it were, bound by affliction under his own providential dealings, or to those who are oppressed or held as captives or thrown into prison on his account. That, the particular reference here seems to be to David and to those associated with him who were straightened, or deprived of their freedom in the cause of God. And so I see, you know, I think that it's speaking of the former, those who are oppressed, who are held as captives. And, uh, you know, so you know, God doesn't forget those people who are in those situations. Psalm chapter 69, verse 7, For thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. Uh, let's see here. Okay. I think that I, I think that I put that there, Psalm sixty nine, verse seven, because this verse comes earlier before uh, verse thirty three, and he's saying, Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered thy face. So he's saying that, you know, he is being persecuted because of his faith. And so that's what he means when he's saying that the Lord hears the poor, that he despises not the prisoners, that he doesn't forget those who have borne reproach for his name. Okay, now, Kevin Zachary says, where does the idea from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10 come from? And that's what we went over just previously, where he said, uh, you know, Paul said uh, that Jesus led captivity captive, and, you know, he's the one who descended and ascended. Well, plainly from chap plainly from Psalm chapter 68 verse 18, which is quoted almost word for word in Ephesians 4 chapter 4 verse 8. So, 
Kevin Zacher is saying that Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, which says that Jesus led captivity captive, you know, he ascended, he descended, uh, comes from Psalm 69, verse 33, which says, The Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. It has absolutely nothing to do with that passage. But Psalm chapter 68, verse 18, however, is almost word for word. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, for thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might, the Lord God might dwell among them. So it's talking about led captivity captive, ascended on high. So I just thought that was funny to point out that he's saying, you know, he's trying to quote a reference to a verse which has nothing to do with it, when there is a reference that you could easily find that is almost exactly word for word. All right. Preached unto the spirits in prison. This is another popular verse. I've talked about this a lot. The Abraham's wisdom doctrine. And I don't know if Kevin Zacher says more here. I should have spent more time going over these things. I'm not going to play this four minute clip right now. But basically, we got First Peter chapter three verse nineteen, which says, "By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison." And so people try to say that Jesus went and preached to these saints that were. In Abraham's bosom on the cross, um, or that he went and preached to people in hell. There's different variations on these things. Totally misses the point of this verse. Uh, first of all, we're talking about the Spirit, because in verse 18, uh, let's just look at that. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. First oh, Peter 3, 18. Okay. For Christ also hath suffered, hath, hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Okay. So I think we're talking about the Holy Spirit here. He preached unto the spirits in which are people, the spirits of people in times past who are now in prison in hell because they did not repent. And so we got First Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which is the next verse, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So basically, the spirit, you know, was spoke through Noah, preaching for men to repent and to get in the ark. And, uh, anyways, I mean, preaching for men to repent, and they didn't listen, and so they died, and they went to hell. So, so the Spirit preached through him, to these people who are now the spirits in prison because they didn't repent, okay? I know I don't always explain things the best way, but hopefully you get that. Just think about it. I'm going to move forward. He made a show of them openly. Colossians, or Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, nailing it to his cross, and has, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And so, uh, <clears throat> Kevin Zacher basically says here that having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over in it. He says that when Jesus died on the cross, Afterwards, he went down to hell, and um, he basically he basically laughed at the people in hell about how they had been conquered. Okay, that's not what it means. So he made a show of them openly. As a conqueror, returning from a victory, displays in a triumphal possession or procession the kings and princes whom he has taken, and the spoils of victory. This was commonly done when a triumph was decreed for a conqueror. On such occasions, it sometimes happened that a 
considerable number of prisoners were led among the midst of the scenes of triumph. See the notes at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul says that this was now done openly. That is, it was in the face of the whole universe, a grand victory, a glorious triumph over all the powers of hell. It does not refer to any public procession or display on the earth, but to the grand victory as achieved in view of the universe, by which Christ, as a conqueror, dragged Satan and his legions at his triumphal car. Compare Romans chapter 16, verse 12. And I'm interested what Romans chapter 16, verse, or Romans 16, verse 20, sorry, I wonder what Romans 16, verse 20 says. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay. Well, anyways, um, so it doesn't say anything about Jesus going to hell and mocking or, you know, preaching to the people in hell or anything like that. Okay. It's when Jesus died on the cross, he conquered death and the power of sin and Satan and all that goes that goes with it okay and so uh, the act of him doing that was him showing the triumph over them okay I mean it should be pretty easy to understand really uh, you know Kevin Zacher here says, Jesus didn't go to hell to burn. He went down there to triumph over them. And I said that there's no verse in all of Holy Scripture that teaches Jesus went to hell. Okay, in any sense. And such a statement is blasphemous as hell is the place for the damned. Okay. Heaven is for God. Heaven is for the saints. Hell is for the damned. And for Satan. Okay. Get that figured out. This was a bizarre one. Hell hath enlarged herself. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 14. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure in their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoice, rejoiceth shall descend into it. Let's go ahead and play this clip. So, yeah. What happened after he led captivity captive? Look at Isaiah 5. Let's look, let's look at Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5. What happened after he led captivity captive? Look at Isaiah and verse 5. 14. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and her glory and her and multitude 14. and her pomp and he that rejoiceth Therefore, hell shall descend into it. Herself, and opened so her mouth without after measure, and their glory and their the saints of God departed and from the and side of paradise shall descend and into by the way we can see that illustration so with the, the rich man and Lazarus which we will cover from the side um, of paradise hell and by the took way we can see that all of that side that was paradise the rich when he led captivity captive we Jesus cover. took all the saints to heaven um, hell the bible says here at verse 14 of, all of that Isaiah 5 paradise. therefore when hell had the large herself Jesus and opened her mouth without measure hell, the bible says so, here in verse 14 Isaiah 5 Hell, which is also temporary, just like paradise, and opened her mouth was temporary. So, so Jesus took care of the paradise now, site first, uh, but hell which is, also is uh, still a temporary like place until was temporary. all of the wicked are judged Jesus took care at the end of the millennium first, and cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Is, uh, still a temporary place until all of the wicked are judged. And the reason that, judged that hell the took over all that site is because paradise was no longer needed. Of eternity. Wow. Okay. And the reason that. So I guess he's trying to say that. Uh, because paradise was no longer needed. This is supposed to be some kind of prophecy of when Jesus led uh, the saints from this Abraham's bosom place to heaven and then hell was enlarged. Ugh, I don't know. So it says, therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure in their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall ascend into it. This is Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14. What's the context? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, the verse before it says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. The po poetic representation is, and this is obviously po po poetic, 
it's talking about hell as being, you know, it refers to hell as her, and all this other stuff, that so many of the Jews would be cut off by famine, thirst, and the sword, that those vast regions would be obliged to enlarge themselves in order to receive them. It means, therefore, that while many of them would go into captivity in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, vast multitudes of them would be cut off by famine, thirst, and the sword. So that's what it's talking about. Okay. Hell hath enlarged itself. So it's basically saying that some people are going to go into captivity, but the others are facing hell in the form of destruction, fame and thirst, and death, okay, as opposed to being captives. It has nothing to do with the abode of the, the damned uh, enlarging itself or anything else. Uh, wow, it's just unbelievable that he has used this verse for this. I mean... And the abode of the damned is eternal, just like heaven is. So, let's see here. Destination of paradise and hell. So i got a couple of clips here. He goes over some things. He goes over 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Basically, they try to use these verses to say that, they'll say that paradise was in the earth before Jesus died on the cross, and then after Jesus died on the cross, paradise was moved up to heaven. Well, here's what i got to say about that. Paradise is heaven. It always has been, and it always will be. To say that paradise is hell is an oxymoron. This is exactly what men are saying when they use Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, or Acts chapter 2, verse 27 as a proof text that Jesus went to hell. Because it says that uh, Jesus, it says that, you know, his soul would not be left in hell, basically. And so I've covered that in other studies, and I'll, I'll cover that again. But it doesn't mean that Jesus went to hell, okay? Uh, and to say that, you know, paradise is a term used for a good place of enjoyment. Hell is used for a place of eternal damnation and suffering, okay? So to try to mix these two, to say that there was a place that was in hell, or called hell, that was paradise too, is just an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Kevin Zacher talks about hell will be in the lake of fire, and he's reading from Revelation chapter 20. And it's, verse, it's basically verse 14, I think. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So I said Revelation is a highly symbolic book, is to be understood as an allegory. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 does not teach that God will take one abode for the damned and move it to another abode. There are two abodes for the souls of men to live in for eternity, heaven and hell. That is all there ever has been, and that is all there ever will be. This passage should be understood from a Christian perspective that the ways of the world, as we have no... <laughs> I guess I need to put as we have known, or as we know will be no more. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Sin, death, and suffering will be cast into the lake of fire to be burnt up. As if to say that these things are cast into a furnace to be destroyed and defeated once and for all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 25 and verse 26 says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The damned will stay where they are now in torment for eternity. That's all there is to it. So, uh, hopefully you understand some of these things that I went over, um, seeing some of the folly, in, uh, or all the folly in Kevin. Zachary's interpretations here, how he completely misunderstands and misteaches these verses. I've got another page working on Abraham's bosom going over other verses, you know, key verses that he didn't go over um, that I'll talk about more. 
I've also got um, some from the Schofield Bible where he teaches Abraham's bosom, and I might get some other commentaries from other men because it's very popular. And I'm starting to realize that the Schofield Bible taught tons and tons of error and popularized tons of error, and I think that it's a big problem for what we have today uh, with all this misunderstanding of Scripture. But uh, speaking of other verses here, and uh, let's see, a lot of the whole Abraham's bosom passage itself. Um, but anyways, let's see here what I got. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Well, anyway, yeah, so I'm going to go over this more. I'm uh, just sharing this for now, going over Kevin Zachary's teaching. And uh, so hopefully you uh, understood that. You know, when it says no man hath ascended up to heaven, it means, you know, you haven't been to heaven to speak of heavenly truths in the way that Jesus can. I haven't been to heaven in the way that Jesus has to speak of truths as he can. Um, it speaks of the deity of Christ. Um, you know, that he was with the Father eternally before he took on flesh. That's the whole point of it. That's the context. You know, that's a great truth, okay? To take it to mean what Kevin Zacher is trying to say that teaches that the souls of the saints before Jesus died didn't go to heaven is absolutely wrong. Of course they did. There's only been two places for the souls of men to go. Heaven and hell. That's all there ever was. And the whole argument that Jesus had to die on the cross yet, it doesn't matter because we read about how Abraham and King David, they had faith in God and they were justified. Okay? God knew, the Father knew, you know, from eternity that the Son was going to come to the earth and die for the sins of mankind. It was already a done thing in the Father's eyes. So, uh, you know, God has an eternal perspective on things. So, anyways, uh, you know, as if to say that somehow the saints died before Jesus died, that somehow they were lesser or they don't have the opportunities that we do today. Is just absolutely wrong, okay? As far as, you know, their souls and our souls going to heaven. No, they were just as much justified and forgiven and cleansed of their sin as we are. Ugh. So anyways, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Leave some comments. Let me know what you think. And uh, there will be more on this subject, and I'll try to explain better and better as I go on. But this needs to be debunked. It's foolish, and I want to hear it quit being taught. Of course, that won't happen. But I want to hear more people teaching the truth on this matter. Uh, you know, Stephen Anderson is one who uh, teaches many things wrong, but he does teach right on this. And so there's not a whole lot that I've seen preach out against this Abraham's Wisdom Doctrine, but Stephen Anderson has. So you can check out his stuff on it, too. Uh, but I think he doesn't go into as much detail as this, and uh, you know, I'm going to go into even more detail. <clears throat> but thanks for watching, guys. God bless.